Hi there, and welcome to Central Texas Gardener. I'm Tom Spencer. The best way to get ideas for your garden is to walk around and see what your fellow gardeners are doing. It's a way to meet new plants and translate design concepts to your own space. So today we preview the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center tour that features native plants in home garden settings. Right now, let's get a closer look at one of them. In early March, there is much to see and hear on the land that Paula and Dan restored to its native heritage. By April, the views will be different, and again in September and December. Twenty years ago, they bought the land that adjoined the house where they raised their children. Always, this was their favorite backyard. Eventually, they made it their house in the trees and supplemented nature's garden to respect the land rather than altering it with a lawn or flowers all in a row. I grew up in West Texas, and uh, but I spent my childhood years during the summers in these limestone hills west of Austin. And uh, this piece of land just reminds me of those happy childhood days. And so I was able to uh, come back and uh, uh, capture uh, that in a mu very meaningful way. What we were after was uh, a house that had a relationship to the outside from every point on the inside. From the beginning, it was a collaboration among them, the land, architect Paul Lamb, and David Mahler, ecologist and landscape designer for environmental survey consulting. Although they carefully worked around the native trees, David excavated hundreds of invasive exotics. David added native species to supplement the ones that revived once the exotics were cleared. He worked with the natural bluff to build low impact walkways. Then David designed a cool and comforting grotto that begins the journey down the hill in a series of waterfalls to a pond. It started with Dan's idea of a pond at the edge of the bluff. For 20 years, he had noted the natural pooling after a heavy rainstorm. Like all great inspirations from nature, it grew from there. From open windows and outdoors, the waterfalls cancel the sound of the highway that carries through the trees. The stream appears to begin in front. Along with uniting the two spaces, it designates the entrance to the house and the front yard living room that Dan and Paula wanted. It has the, uh, the relationship to the outside that we were seeking uh, with the noise of the water and uh, the trees uh, being as close to the house as we could preserve them. In fact, this tree is, uh, if you look on the other side, there are little two by four strips nailed in the bottom of it going up the tree, which is where our son would climb and repel out of the branches <laughs> of this tree. <laughs> and, and as a little boy, so we made this tree uh, the centerpiece of this courtyard. <laughs> Another centerpiece is the Thunder House aligned with the compass to hang out in rain or sun and view the front from all angles. Instead of lawn, Dan told David that he wanted to wander trails that are never static. Well, I told him I was getting rid of my lawnmower and I never wanted to see or hear another one. <laughs> I just didn't want to do that anymore. These plants uh, appear and disappear and uh, going through the seasons, uh, one will replace another just as you're 
saying, oh, I wish that plant would bloom a little bit longer. Something is right behind it, showing you something very different and new and fresh. And that's just so much more interesting to me than uh, mowing a St. Augustine yard. <laughs> They did plant native buffalo grass in the septic field, but it's also a wildflower meadow. In early March, overwintering species that bloom from spring through fall are mere rosettes, but not for long. And we don't mow it. It, it just lays over and uh, takes care of itself. To guide the way at night, Paul Lamb designed lights with plumb bobs and colored glass for an unobtrusive parachuting illumination among the trees. The wildlife only needed water and an ongoing food supply to find their way day or night. The animals, birds, butterflies, dragonflies, frogs, turtles, are not attracted to uh, a mown lawn. There's no relationship there. I just think that watching these uh, wonderful variety of plants we have grow and change and evolve over a 12-month period or a 20-year period of time is just something to look forward to. It, it ha it's ever-changing. It's, uh, uh, it's not monotonous. It's not uh, homogenized. It's uh, just the way it was meant to be. And the authenticity of this land is just uh, very special to me. That is one of several beautiful gardens that are going to be available for your ple viewing pleasure coming up on during the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center's annual tour of gardens here in the Central Texas area. I'm joined now by Andrea DeLong Amaya from the Wildflower Hello. Center. It's always great to, uh, to have you back at this time of year because it means one thing. Time for the tour. Garden tour, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and this is such a great opportunity for the gardeners of Central Texas to get out there and really get inspired by some really cool spaces. Yeah, we've been really had a lot of fun looking at all the gardens and finding a good variety of things that will, you know, some of them are nice small little gardens mm -hmm. and some of them are nice big gardens and mm -hmm. some of them have more naturalistic feel or more stylized or mm -hmm. stylish feel to them. So I think people will get a good range of experiences on this tour. As individual as the people who own them. That's right. And, and that's the cool thing about gardens is that they really do reflect people, not just nature, it's a reflection of a personality as Absolutely. well. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, and you know, I had the great pleasure of being one of the uh, host gardens last year. We loved it, it was <laughs> wonderful. Well, well, it was wonderful for us too, and I think this is the great thing about the tour, is you get to see so many people, and there's so, it's such a happy day. Oh, you know? you're frolicking in the gardens, <laughs> how wonderful. <laughs> you know, people yeah. are genuinely thrilled to be able to see other gardens. And what I always tell people when I do garden classes, Andrea, is like, visit gardens and steal ideas. Steal ideas. <laughs> and I know people really love to be able to talk to the homeowners or yeah. the, the designers and get ideas and what mm -hmm. are the plants and what was the, the whole process of how the garden has evolved. That's always interesting for people. Right, right. Well, let's give, let's give the basic information about how it works and then we'll take people on a quick tour of some of the other gardens that are going to be part of this year's tour. It's very easy. You can, it's very do you, easy. Um, where do people pick up tickets? Um, if you go to our website, you can. Mm -hmm. uh, this time, we're going to actually have our tickets available on the website. Okay. And then we also have uh, a few different nurseries that'll mm -hmm. be selling the tickets for us. The same folks that have been doing it for the last okay. few years. Also, the Wildflower Center store is a good place okay. to get uh, the tickets. The event is May 9th, which right. is the Saturday before Mother's Day. It's a Always. great, great Mother's Day. Yeah, uh, that was one activity. of the fun things last year. Lots of people lots with of their people mothers. With their moms. Yeah, yeah. it's cool. So it'll be nine to five, rain or shine. Mm -hmm. If it's sunny, which it probably will be in you know that time of year, mm -hmm. uh, encouraging people to wear a hat and sunscreen and get your comfortable shoes and yeah. water and maybe some iced coffee or something to be yeah. fresh yeah. and come tour around. Yeah, and you can buy, you can go to one garden if, if you only have time for one, but you can mm -hmm. buy a little booklet and visit all of them. Yeah, right? if you get a wristband, you get to all of the gardens mm -hmm. and it's um, five gardens plus the Wildflower Center, mm -hmm. so that's six, it's a good deal. Um, and, or as you said, you could pick and choose and just go to one or two if you right. prefer, if you're well, limited we, on time. We already saw the beautiful video of one garden, and let's go ahead and, and introduce some of the other uh, gardens that people could visit. 
the next one on the list, there's one on Academy, mm -hmm. uh, which is a, a, I really like the look of this one. I, you know, lots of cool plants here. Yeah, this is a fun little garden, and fun is the right word. Um, it's small, uh, mm -hmm. it's one of the two smaller gardens on the tour. And it's very much um, a very stylish garden. It mm -hmm. fits very much in the South Congress district. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> the, Soco it, cool the Soco gardens. Cool. The Soco Cool, right? <laughs> um, and it's it's wonderfully quirky, and I mean yeah. in a wonderful way. Um, the uh, the homeowners have added little touches here and there. There's mm. a little scene of where the wild things are with mm -hmm. little figures, and <laughs> uh, as you can see in the pictures, there's some neon signs and lots mm -hmm. of fun stuff going on in that garden. It's well, warm. It, it, some Austin gardens should be a little weird, they don't you think? They should be. This is Austin. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, again, that's, I think, part of the playfulness of gardening. It's not, it mm -hmm. doesn't, you don't have to be serious about this. It should reflect who you are. Absolutely. And I think the people will get a strong sense of the owners at this particular one. And there's, uh, uh, the, uh, the plant choices here I really do love. I mean, because they make a lot of sense, mm -hmm. but there's, it's bold, too. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, one of the most effective is along the side of the house. There's just a nice long bank of inland sea oats, and it mm -hmm. frames the trail, the pathway that goes from the front to the backyard, and it leads you through very nicely, mm -hmm. and I think it's very effective that way. Yeah, and out by the street, some really strong agaves oh, yeah. with flowy grasses and things like that. The homeowners like. were, said that they had gone through several iterations of gardens out out there and mm. they have to be durable. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> and we're in that location, it has to be durable. That, absolutely. So that is, again is on Academy in South Austin, and uh, just what you would expect from yeah. that neighborhood of Fun Garden. Uh, the next one is on Buckeye, and this is one with an incredible meadow of uh, native plants. Yeah, this garden is nice. It has a good combination of uh, the open meadow. Mm -hmm. um, sort of a prairie restoration mm -hmm. and then also around the house has a lot of trees so that area is a mix between sunny and wooded areas. Mm -hmm. It's a pretty large garden with uh, pretty extensive trails mm -hmm. and it's a good plant collection. There's just a huge amount of diversity that um, that the homeowners and the designer have built. It's um, designed by Jill Noakes mm -hmm. and uh, she and the homeowners have worked very closely together to create an interesting and dynamic landscape there. Yeah, I love the idea of restored meadows, and we actually have some images that show the kind of the process of this evolving from the planting yeah. all the way full to this very full, lush looking, what well, looks completely natural, but it's not. It's right. a garden. <laughs> it is a garden, yeah. yeah. It's cultivated. And in May, it should look really colorful, too. Yeah, I'm sure it will. And, mm -hmm. and there are plenty of places to kind of go and explore paths and other kinds yeah. of things through yeah. the woods here as well. Lots of little surprises around every corner. Yeah. One of the things I heard about this garden is that uh, they really wanted their children to have a natural experience when they walk out the door. And I, I would, could if see If I were that. a kid, I would love to grow up in that garden. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think people need to think about things like that. Uh, the next garden is on Kempson. And uh, this, uh, again, lots of great use of stone in this garden. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Lots of cool plants, too. Lots of great uh, uh, bold plants, as well as lots of wavy grasses and things. Yeah, this is a, a, seat, a sweet little garden that when you first come up to it from the street, it looks like really the rest of the neighborhood. It doesn't look special at all. But when you go in the backyard, um, the homeowners have been very careful to restore or, or preserve a lot of the original uh, mm -hmm. landscape that was there. Uh, a lot of the stone that was in the picture was excavated from the site, and then they reused it in the in the garden, which is great. Mm -hmm. um, so they have a nice little area where um, uh, he's even collected stuff that he's you know from sea that he's found in the neighborhood and thrown him in the rocks. Yeah. And then there's the wooded area where they've cleaned out some of the mm -hmm. the real dense um, vines and invasive things and have replanted with some other more understory things. Well, it looks like a lot of fun. I love the back view of this house. It, it really is this beautiful sweep of a landscape with all the kind of the plants tucked in amongst the stones and. It looks terrific. I, I really yeah. like the uh, that look. And again, uh, goes to the point of what the Wildflower Center is all about. This this is a garden that really saves on resources and yet is beautiful when it comes to the aesthetics. You know? It's a great example of what you can do again with another small space too. Yeah, that's right. It doesn't have to be on a grand scale. Right. Now the next garden. This is this is kind of a different scale and. It looks like a, almost like a theme park almost. <laughs> so this is the LCRA. They have uh, this created this beautiful uh, LEED certified for those who don't know. It's like top environmental rating for a building. Uh, and and, the and they have a four-star uh, Austin Green uh, Energy uh, yeah. four-star rating too. Well, and then the grounds are like like I said, a theme park. Yeah. Yeah, lots and lots of native plants, mm -hmm. um, locally native even. Mm 
uh, and there are a series of like there's a butterfly garden mm -hmm. and, and different um, examples of how mm. you can use plants. They're not all native, but mostly right. native. How you can use them in different contexts. Mm -hmm. uh, I think one of the um, the uh, heart of the garden is actually a, a water feature that has. Uh, it's a model of the six different uh, lakes and dams that LCRA oversees, mm -hmm. and it's an interactive water feature. So you can turn on the rain, or you can close the gates, and <laughs> it's really fun. And we'll be having um, guided tours by Excellent. LCRA representatives throughout the day to well, explain it. And I know that the LCRA is promoting the use of native and azeric plant materials throughout the hill country, and it makes so much sense for us. And here's a great opportunity to see those in what looks like a gorgeous setting. Yeah, it's really <clears throat> beautiful. And the whole concept really uh, at their garden is about water and, and preserving the water. Yeah, well, and again, it goes with the theme. With the theme so, of native plants. All right, yes. so again, let's just hit the highlights. May 9th. May 9th, uh, from 9 o'clock to 5 in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. Um, it'll be a self-guided tour. People can come and go right. to whichever gardens as they wish. Um, right. You can buy a wristband for all the gardens or buy them individually. Mm -hmm. And uh, all of that information is on our website, which is three w's dot wildflower dot org. Okay, wildflower dot org. Yeah. Very easy to find on the web. And again, also the tickets available at local nurseries as local well. Local nurseries, and yes. Absolutely. Okay. Well, it, it's a great day, a great a way to celebrate Mother's Day weekend. Certainly, something that I encourage people to go as families and br and bring mom with you. Uh, it would be a wonderful way to uh, give her a treat as well as to celebrate a, a beautiful way uh, to you know be a family together out there in all these fantastic spaces and bring your notebook. <laughs> Steal the ideas. <laughs> Andre, it's always a pleasure to see oh, you. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for your interest. Okay, okay. Well, uh, good luck this uh, uh, season with the tour. And coming up next is our friend Skip Brinker. Hello and welcome to Down to Earth. This week's question regards growing vegetables in a small space. You may live in a condo or townhome or an apartment where you don't have a lot of land to grow vegetables in, or perhaps you've got land but it's covered with giant trees and there's this one little sunny spot down out there on the driveway where you can put a few vegetables in. You know, we have a lot of options for doing that. The best way to do it is in containers. Some of the larger containers that are available now are, are just excellent for growing vegetables. If you get something that'll hold about five gallons of soil or a five gallon bucket, bucket worth of soil, you can grow almost anything in that. Uh, you can grow in smaller containers as well, but if you have a larger amount of soil, it gives the plant a chance to grow a little more, and you don't have to water it quite as often. The smaller the container gets, the more often you have to water to keep it from wilting and going into stress. So give them as much room as you can. Choose a good quality potting soil too, and make sure there's air, uh, holes at the bottom of the container to allow excess water to drain out. Uh, but containers come in all kinds of forms. I like the very lightweight. They look like terracotta or stone, but they're actually made out of a polycarbonate material. They're excellent to use. Uh, I've used everything from an old bathtub to a giant half whiskey barrel uh, to plant in. Anything you can find a whole soil and then has good drainage is good for growing vegetables. You can also grow vertically. Maybe you just have a narrow spot of soil where you can plant in, but by putting a trellis up, you can grow your vines on that. You can grow even watermelons and cantaloupe on a trellis if you support the fruit. You can use a section of pantyhose or some of the onion sacks from the grocery store, anything to kind of create a sling to hold that fruit up on the trellis. That way, rather than covering a large area of ground, you're using a little bit of soil area to grow a lot of vegetables. Finally, look for varieties that are made for more compact growth. Some of our trailing uh, varieties of uh, things like cucumbers, for example, or squashes are actually more compact and will fit into a smaller area better. Don't be afraid to let them trail on off the balcony if it's a green, uh, some type of greens like Malabar. Those are actually quite attractive in a trailing format. So don't let space stop you from growing a vegetable garden. There's lots of ways to do that. Our featured plant this week is Blackfoot Daisy. Blackfoot Daisy is native to the hill country. It grows out of a crack in the rock. It's so easy to grow. I think everybody ought to have them all around the place. Uh, it just needs some sunlight and it insists on good drainage. This is an excellent plant if you want to use a, a decomposed granite mulch for 
it's really happy with that. If you put it in a bed that's full of organic matter and a really wet organic uh, surface mulch like wood chips or compost, it may tend to rot on you during wet weather. But if you allow really good drainage and, and uh, provide it with the sun it needs, Blackfoot Daisy is extremely easy to grow. Goes good in a container too. Being a perennial, uh, it's just a lot of fun and I think the flowers are really attractive as well. It's a good ground cover or a good uh, plant to put around the base of other plants as long as it gets the sunlight. Things to do in the garden include taking care of those newly planted woody ornamentals. You may have spent some money this year putting in a tree or a woody vine or a shrub. You want to make sure and give those good care. The first summer is the critical one. They're trying to grow, they're trying to get roots established, and then here comes a Texas summer. That's when we lose most of our plants. Either they lack water or the planting hole becomes an underground flower pot that holds water and it literally drowns them because we overwater the plants. So you want to find that happy medium of moist soil continue to water them. I like to build a berm of soil around my plants about a three-foot circle, just sort of a raised donut of soil, and that way you can put a water hose in and fill it up and give it one good soaking a week or maybe two good soakings a week depending on the weather and the type of soil you have, and they'll do really well. You want to prune all those spring blooming plants once they finish blooming. Anything that blooms only in the spring, prune it at the end of its bloom cycle, and that sets it up to put on new growth, set new blooms for next year. So now would be the time to start doing that. And finally, when you're fertilizing annuals and perennials, do so about every month, month and a half, to keep them vigorous and healthy. For more information or to contact the county extension office in your area, visit the klru.org slash ctg website. Thanks, Skip. Now let's check in with Tricia Shirey for Backyard Basics. There's perhaps no greater symbol for the state of Texas than our own blue bonnet, but they can be problematic to get established in our yards. It's amazing that they're beautiful in fields along the roadsides, but many people are frustrated with trying to get blue bonnets growing in their own home garden. Now, if you have a heavy clay soil, blue bonnets will just not be happy there. They need full sun. They like alkaline soil, but good drainage is actually the probably the biggest key. They don't compete well with St. Augustine or Bermuda lawns. So you really are not going to be successful with establishing them in healthy lawns. There are many colors available with blue bonnets these days, and you can find transplants in the nurseries and garden centers in December and January, typically. Uh, so that's a great way to get these new colors in, although you can find some of them by seed too, but the transplants are really the easiest way to go. And if you want to keep the colors true, keep them planted away from blue bonnets that are blue because that will become the dominant color, and in successive years, you'll have fewer and fewer of your colors. Now, one of the things that's interesting about blue bonnets is their uh, pollination. They are pollinated by bees, and the little white spot on the flower turns to a maroon color after a bee has visited. And the bee lands on the bottom of the flower and pushes down the bottom of the flower, and a little wolf claw is evident inside that flower. And the, the pollen is inside that claw. So after the bee visits that spot, conveniently turns to maroon so that other bees don't waste their time on that flower. So if you're picking blue bonnets for a flower arrangement, look for flowers that are mostly white because they'll last longer in arrangements. Also, the action of picking your blue bonnets regularly prevents them from going to seed. They're an annual, so that will keep your blue bonnets blooming even longer if you can prevent their going to seed. But you do want to make sure that you let some of the blue bonnets go to seed so you'll have them coming back in the same spot. Now, it's important not to mow too early. Sometimes people don't like the ragged look of their blue bonnets and they mow them too early and that's why they don't come back again next year. So when the blue bonnets have these kind of fuzzy seed pods, open up a pot or two. Inside, the seed should not be green. They should look brown or grayish and look almost like little gravel pieces. They're very, very hard when they're mature. At that point, you can mow your blue bonnets and they'll come back for you. Sometimes the seeds will actually split open and they'll throw the, the seeds everywhere. So scattering them even widely. Now you can take the blue bonnet hay after you've mowed the blue bonnets, take that blue bonnet hay and put it in other places and extend your blue bonnets to other areas and you'll have uh, even more blue bonnets to look forward to in the next year. So those are some of the ways that you can get blue bonnets growing and established in your own yard 
garden and uh, enjoy the state flower for many years to come. For more tips, online video, and our weekly blog, visit klru.org slash ctg. Next week, check out Herbs to Flavor Summertime Recipes. Until then, I'll see you in the garden. Visit klru.org slash ctg to learn more about today's program, upcoming events, and to sign up for our electronic newsletter. Check out John's how-to tips and visit Trisha's Corner for ideas inside and out. Get growing at klru.org slash ctg.